ask you to change the, the slides, yeah? Okay, good. All right, well, um, <clears throat> uh, so, D'abord, j'aimerais bien dire un bon, un grand merci à Vladimir Petrov pour l'invitation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Vladimir, for inviting me. Um, I'm aiming to leave some time at the end for some questions because, unfortunately, I can't be with you for the general discussion afterwards. Uh, and what this is going to be is rather different from what's been uh, uh, some of the presentations I've been seeing so far, uh, and yet intimately related because it's something which you're all concerned with. Um, Alexander in his uh, talk just before the last one was talking about sort of recent developments which he asked whether philosophers have taken any notice of them. And but this is very much about the philosophical predicament, which has existed now for a hundred years since the inception of, uh, of quantum mechanics. And um, people who are aware of the literature will know that there are, there's a vast range of different ideas about how to make sense of fundamental quantum mechanics. It's really not resolved. Um, and let's hope that one day it will be. But anyway, this is going to be about one of the ways which has been suggested of doing it, which is the Everett Many Worlds interpretation. Um, now, Everett uh, was a student at Princeton in the 50s. He was at Einstein's last lectures. He was quite likely influenced by Einstein's love of the idea of what he called strict causality. Um, his supervisor was John Archibald Wheeler, of course, a very famous distinguished uh, physicist. And when uh, Everett published his very short thesis, which is the seminal work, which is the origin of the, the interpretation, alongside it, uh, Wheeler. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll come to the next slide in a moment. Um, alongside it, Wheeler published an article which was a uh, short article, which was really in awe of what, uh, of what Everett was proposing. And yet Wheeler was caught because he was a very great friend of Bohr and Bohr was, he wanted Everett to, to meet Bohr and he did, but Bohr was completely, and, and his entourage were completely, uh, completely unimpressed. So, um, so the idea fell into obscurity until it was revived by Bryce D. Witt in some articles in um, uh, the beginning of the 70s in a book in 73, which jointly, uh, uh, and then gradually more and more work started to be done on the average interpretation, and it's still very much ongoing. And why is it ongoing? Well, it's ongoing because it raises some real philosophical challenges. They're really philosophical challenges, not uh, physics challenges. So, um, so let me just outline the, the very basic idea as it comes across, as I understand it, in his original paper. Of course, as with everything, people have different ideas about what their idea is. But here, I think, I, I think it, it can be put across like this. What he's saying is, look, the, actual, the distinction between actual and possible is uh, an old fashioned metaphysical distinction. We've had come down the ages, we've had it for millennia, it's part of our everyday talk. And yet it's not essential to physics. Physics can do without it. All the so-called possible outcomes of a quantum measurement of a quantum process they all exist they're all they, they're all actual there is no difference between physical possibility and physical actuality the, with the result that if you're in your laboratory and you do something like a spin measurement then what happens is that the apparatus and the laboratory and you split into two distinct states one where the, you get a result up, one where you get a result down relative to whatever axis you've chosen. So this idea of splitting is, uh, it, was, it was added in a footnote by, by uh, 
over it famously because because the obvious explanation is that the that Wheeler really couldn't didn't want it to put it in the thesis, but he added it in the last minute as a sort of note. So what what problems does that pose? It poses the problem of identity. How do you understand continuing identity when things split, when things, when the histories are, are, are dendritic, not linear? How do you understand probability when there's no such thing as possibility? Uh, there are no alternatives. All the futures exist. How can probability a, a, apply? And yet probability, as you all know, is something that you're dealing with all the time in quantum mechanics. And finally, what the thing which splits according to 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 Everett is uh, is wave function. So the laboratory is its wave function. Your body, which splits, is its wave function. How can we understand uh, wave function as something which is concretely existing? And that's what brings me to the. Cheshire Cat, which was in the first slide. Some of you might have recognized the illustration from the original <clears throat> edition of Alice in Wonderland. The Cheshire Cat disappears and all it leaves is an enigmatic grin. So what I'm going to be suggesting is that wave function uh, is like the enig enigmatic grin of the Cheshire Cat. And so now we're on the second slide and... Um, no, the one, the one that you was just up just now, yeah, that one. So, um, so Everett called it his theory a pure wave theory. So, what does that mean? Okay, as I've been just suggesting, what he actually says in this paper is the wave function is taken as the basic physical entity. Right, that's what he writes in 1957. So, next slide. So what, this is what he writes in that seminal paper. This paper proposes to regard pure wave mechanics as a complete theory. It postulates that a wave function supplies a complete mathematical model for every isolated physical system. It further postulates that every system that is subject to external observation can be regarded as part of a larger isolated system. So, is a wave function an abstract mathematical model, or is it a concrete physical entity? There's an ambiguity there. So we can go to the next slide. This, this ambiguity is endorsed by Sean Carroll in his recent book. Okay, it's a, a book for the general public, but in a book for the general public, one hopes to be as clear as possible. And I think this, is undoubtedly confusing because what he writes is what the what is what the world is made of a quantum wave function wave functions are superpositions of different possibilities wave functions may be real but they're undeniably abstract so he's saying that our concrete world is undeniably abstract and made of possibilities i think we need some help to uh, clarify that. So we go on to the next slide. And it's set theory, which I'm going to suggest can come to the rescue and clarify uh, and resolve this ambiguity. So let's go on to the, the next slide then. So how can set theory help? Well, set theory arose in the late 19th century and brought a revolution to the philosophy of mathematics. Um, it, the, it involved some of these names listed here, which uh, you will be familiar with uh, some of the great names in mathematics. And for those of you not familiar with the history, this book on the, uh, on the left, Logic Comics, is quite an entertaining introduct uh, introduction to the history, if you'd like. It's just a, a, a suggestion. But what's this got to do with the abstract concrete distinction? Well, Set theory has always been thought, sets have always been thought of as abstract. It's generally recognized now that you can do all mathematics in terms of set theory. 
but sets apparently are, are abstract in the sense of you know not existing in space and time. Uh, why? Because sets are also called classes or like categories of things. So, so for instance, if you take of the set of all apples, uh, it's it's not an apple. I mean, it, it's not something physical. It's a it's a category. Yeah. It, you can't. It doesn't seem to be something physical at all. So how can how can we talk in terms of sets as being concrete? Well, uh, Willard von Norman Quine in the book on the uh, on the right there that um, came out at the end of the sixties, uh, famous Harvard logician who worked a lot in mathematical logic, he made a suggestion as how about how a particular type of set could be a, a concrete object. Uh, and so I'll come to the details of that in a moment. But at first, what we'll do is just have an overall view of how set theory might apply to, uh, to quantum physics. We go to the next slide. So the wave function of the universe is a set of interacting parallel universes. OK, so we think of the think of the observable universe right the observable universe extends out to about 46 billion light years in our absolute elsewhere it's a causally isolated physical system according to one mechanic quantum mechanics there is a wave function for that thing okay the idea is that that one thing what it is is a set and it's a set of interacting parallel universes why interacting why parallel that's what we come to the next slide. Configurations of matter and energy on the past light cone surfaces of parallel universes are macroscopically isomorphic and microscopically anisomorphic. So here we are. Here's an object which is on the surface of the, our past light cone. Here, the idea is that this very object is a set of a set of objects which are macroscopically isomorphic and microscopically anisomorphic in the sense that what that set includes is every configuration of particles. Uh, I'm thinking in terms of, of, of fields as well, but let's just talk in terms of particles. Every configuration of particles which could make up this macroscopic apple, that exists as an element of the set, which is this apple. Right, so the idea is that this apple is set theoretically extended in configuration space. And as a set, um, it could well be an infinite set. I mean, we would, it depends on whether you think in terms of space time as continuous or not, but, and there are other considerations, but for all intents and purposes, for the think of it in terms of being an infinite set. So we go to the next slide. An observer's environmental universe is a set of interacting elemental universes. So what this does is introduce a fundamental dichotomy in objects, the existence of physical objects relative to an observer, okay? Because observers are situated in this quantum multiverse of, uh, of Everett. And we're situating them in, a, in this, in a particular way such that objects in, an, in, a, in a, an observer's environment, the sort of things we can interact with, uh, they're sets of interacting ele elemental universes, okay? So the, uh, again, we would take the apple, it's the, the, elements of this apple, the, the configurations, uh, are interacting. Well, we'll come to why a bit later on, but I mean, of course, the, it's also interacting with, with the wider environment as well. So it's not just in terms of that terms of that apple. So we can go to the next slide. Okay, so here is the key idea of Quine, which is going to be of basic importance in building up this picture. He writes, none of the utility of class theory, and where, when he's talking about class theory, he just means sets, the two words are inter inter interchangeable. Class theory, set theory, it's the same thing. None of the utility of class theory is impaired 
by counting an individual, its unit class, the unit class of that unit class and so on as one and the same thing. So what's he saying? He's saying that um, a set which, I mean, it, it sounds almost too ridiculous to, 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 to believe perhaps, but a, once you've got the concept of a set, you can have the concept of a set which is its own soul element. And a set which is its soul, own soul element is a candidate for being, it can be an individual object, okay? So the, what are, the way we're going to use this idea is that by saying that an elemental universe is a quine atom. An elemental universe is a set which is its own element. Um, it's not an abstract set, it's a concrete set. It's an individual concrete thing, okay? And that's that's what an elemental universe is. We go to the next slide. So from there, we can take a bold step where no one has gone before and make this, propose this hypothesis. The idea is in, in proposing this hypothesis, we can construct a coherent account of how wave function can be a concrete object physical, something physically there in our environment. A set of quine atoms has all an, and only the properties which its elements share, other than those which are logically excluded, and excluded properties will clear, include number of elements, and then include value definiteness, which is, of course, terribly, you can see the relation with quantum mechanics straight away, because if we have a set of two quine atoms, and let's say, um, they, those two, okay, let's say one of those quine atoms has a mass of one gram and the other quine atom has a mass of two grams, then the set of the two will have mass and it won't, but it will have indefinite mass, no less than one gram and no more than two grams. And we can also say that a set of set of quine atoms is an abstract object. There's no reason for us to go on and, and postulate more and more concrete object in a, a hierarchy that will do if we that will do as our hypothesis so let's go on to the next one so this is what brings us to our cheshire cat a single environmental electron is a set of elemental electrons which are quine atoms each following a different trajectory in an elemental universe which is a quine atom okay so now you're getting that the elemental uh, universes are rather like what you think of pilot wave universes where, where um, particles follow trajectories. But of course, in pilot wave theory, you only take one configuration. You don't take them all. We're here, we're taking all the configurations. So in each elemental universe, particles follow trajectories. So next slide. An environment, an environmental electron cloud is a set of elemental electrons. Next one. Probability density for a region in the cloud is a subset measure on the set of elemental universes, which is the observer's universe. It's the measure of the subset of elemental universes where elemental electrons are located at parallel elemental regions. That's a bit of a mouthful. But now we're thinking about, okay, here, here we've got the, the what, what is often called the electron cloud or a probability cloud. Imagine taking a region in that cloud. What that, what that a region in that cloud <laughs> delimits is a subset of all the ele elemental electrons that make up the cloud. And that sub, in that subset, <clears throat> that's, a, that's a subset of elemental universes where there's an electron at the corresponding that, that corresp in that corresponding region in each in each universe. Uh, and so to, to the next one. So uh, now we come to the actual process of measuring and Everett's key idea of splitting. Okay, because. On measuring the cloud, and in other words, in, on looking in that cloud and trying to determine a position for an electron, 
Alice splits into observers observing environmental electrons in different regions. Okay, so she for every she's going to have a certain um, resolution of regions that she's going to look at. I mean, let's just say a thousand. She'll split into a thousand different uh, 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 subjects, say, detecting an electron in a different region. And the next slide. She splits because her environmental body is a set of a set of elemental bodies, which partitions into subsets that are the un environmental bodies of the observers making different observations. So, uh, Alice, as she makes her measurement, her body is a set of elemental bodies, a set of bodies which is uh, macroscopically right down to the molecular level, you know, uh, isomorphic, but in terms of, but it's, but including every configuration of particles which make up a body. And that body as will interact with the, uh, or the apparatus, whatever she's measuring apparatus. And in, 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 as a result of that interaction, her body will split into a, a whole, into a number of subsets, each subset being a, a set of bodies, which, it, which is an instancing a particular observation. Each set, each subset will have a, be in a different cognitive state. We go on to the next one. <clears throat> uh, the subset measure of each downstream Alice's universe relative to Alice's universe is the probability that Alice will be an observer observing an electron in each downstream region. So here, okay, we bring uh, the connection between the probability and the probability cloud and the subset measure, because the, the subset measure for each of those subsets of Alice's body after she's made the measurement just is the probability that she will get that result. Uh, it, it, the idea is that I mean this is and this is not what Everett thought because I think the problem with making sense of Everett is he makes some assumptions which we have to to do without. But he he assumed that there could be no objective probability in uh, in his sort of branching multiverse. But here we do have objective probability. Uh, Probability is objectively a subset measure. And when you think about it, if if there were such a thing as objective probability out there in the world, what else could it be but a subset measure, basically on an infinite set? Because you know that's that's what that's what probability is. You know, it, it's it, we're always approximating probability, but what? The the, the 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 essence of probability, if you like, it is a measure on an infinite set. As we go to the next slide, so okay, so we've got this sort of rather <clears throat> Meccano-like uh, set theoretic construction of uh, of wave <clears throat> of the wave function, but you know where's where's the wave aspect? Well, the wave is exactly uh, created by the the interaction and this is uh, not my work there's there were several papers that are about 10 years old now um <clears throat> which um which, which aim to show that if you consider that an ensemble of uh of, un of interacting universes you can produce the wave function to, to take a specific example in this paper um on the um on the right there by um charles sebbins he takes an example, he's, he's imagining, he's taking an ensemble of pilot wave worlds with all the possible trajectories. And what he what he demonstrates is that the, the role of the pilot of the pilot wave can be taken over by the interaction between the world. So that effectively, instead of just having uh, instead of having a basic ontology, I mean a basic idea of what fundamentally exists as particles and the waveguide as, as in pilot wave theory, you can just have 
particles and particles in universes which are interacting and so that will produce waveform in, in the way which is exactly analogous to um, producing waves in a vibrating bath of sand, okay? I mean, the title of uh, Seven's paper is Quantum Mechanics as Classical Physics, and, and that's what it was. Um, but uh, let's go to the next slide. But many interactive worlds lacks environmental superposition because observers inhabit individual universes, not sense of universes. So this idea of many interacting worlds, which was launched sort of around about 10 years ago, hasn't really come to any fruition because it faces the same sort of problems as pilot wave, um, which is, you know, problems about non-locality and and doing all of physics. And why can't you do all of physics with it? Because in pilot wave theory, what you haven't got really, what you haven't got in the environment is wave function. So you've got to find some substitute for it. And the same goes for the many interact worlds, because when, when Sebens and others were thinking many in terms of many interacting worlds, what I call them universes, they're thinking of the observer inhabiting each individual one, and then they have to give a story about uh, how you understand probability and so on. But what I've just suggested is a profound change of perspective. Instead of thinking as we've got a, a many interacting worlds theory, but instead of thinking of the observer as is situated in, in an individual world, individual universe, they are they inhabit the set. And the set is what constitutes the environment. So the set thereby brings the wave function into the environment. It's concrete in the, and it's concrete in the environment as a set of elemental uh, universes. So we can go to the next slide. Um, so what we're doing is really building a bridge between two very outstanding camps in current in, uh, uh, interpretations of, of quantum theory. I mean, there are many different camps, many different type, points of view, but two outstanding ones are the, the Everett Many Worlds and the De Broglie Bogley um, uh, the, um, the, De Broglie. Um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, the the pilot wave the theory. So this is look this, Louis de Broglie, who a uh, hundred years ago, I mean it's just it's just a, it was a hundred years ago, just a, a couple of months back in September, it was published the paper in which he predicted that if you sent electrons through. Um, uh, crystal or crystal lattice, you'd find uh, interference. And it's quite clear when he writes that it, he's not, that it, he, he's thinking in terms of an individual electron will interfere. And, that, and, and, so, and he got the Nobel Prize for that, you know, very well deserved, of course, but that really is, a, is really sort of put the cat amongst the pigeons, that gave us uh, particle wave duality and at the famous Solvay conference. So this is just after Schrodinger's work uh, with, you know, with Schrodinger's work on the on, on wave function. What, what he says is, in, in, roughly speaking, is a wave in configuration space needs to have configurations. Okay, you've got this wave, but where are the configurations? So of course, De Broglie thought in terms of, well, Let's think in terms of the particle and wave guide and so on, but but you know his he got hit by a lot of criticism, and it wasn't until Bohm took up his uh, idea later in the fifties and developed further that it, it was developed into the modern pilot wave um, theory. But there's that theory, you know, which which was involves so called hidden variables, particle following trajectories. There's Everett's theory, which supposedly is pure wave theory, but it doesn't give us any an unambiguous account of, of what a pure wave is. And we can bring them together. We can bring them together by saying, well, 
the, the wave is a set of configurations. That's what the wave is. It's not just one. We don't think in terms of one configuration. Think of it being the set of all the possible configurations. Uh, I mean, um, Deutsch used an expression which I mentioned at the end of this paper. Um, he was talking about the the grooves in in the wave function, and he was sort of he says something to the effect that um, this was back in the nineties. He said. Um, the pilot wave theory was uh, many worlds in denial um, because it just filled one of the grooves in wave function. Well, um, it could you could say that many worlds has been, in a sense, pilot wave or hidden variable theory in denial because in order for the wave function to unambiguously exist, you need to feel all the grooves. So here's the paper which is currently in submission and is. Um, uh, I, uh, well, actually, there's actually there's a there's a this is a, there's a more recent paper which was just posted a couple of days ago, which is which is the which in which I, I got some feedback which made me want to sort of clarify some things, so it's a better one. But anyway, the the overall idea is an observer's universe is a set of interacting parallel universes. The coherence is its partitioning into macroscopically anisomorphic subsets. And um, just to finish, I'd just like to, to read you the, the, the two opening quotes which I use for this paper, which I think is salutary. The first one is from uh, Bourne's uh, Nobel Prize lecture, which was in 1954. And he, he says, the lesson to be learned from what I've told of the origin of quantum mechanics is that probable refinements of mathematical methods will not suffice to produce a satisfactory theory, but that somewhere in our doctrine is hidden a concept, unjustified by experience, which we must eliminate to open up the road. Could it be that the concept we need to eliminate is the concept that sets are abstract, necessarily abstract, and that physical objects cannot be sets. And here uh, is a, a, another quote. This is from Einstein in 1927. It's a letter which he wrote to the Royal Society, which was to be read at um, <clears throat> sort of memorial celebrations of uh, Newton 200 years after Newton's death. And Einstein writes, may the spirit of Newton's method give us the power to restore unison between physical reality and the profoundest characteristic of Newton's teaching, strict causality. Every, I said to us his theory that it was a simple causal theory. There we are. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Paul. Questions? Questions from the our online listeners? No hands. I can I can understand people being a bit. <laughs> okay, I think I think we will continue at the general discussion. Right. Okay, good. Well, I, I, thank you once again, Paul. Okay, I'm just, I'm sorry that I won't be able to be there for the general discussion. Oh, no. no. Oh. It's been a pleasure to be able to um, at least express these ideas. Um, I, I hope they might produce food for thought. <laughs> okay, 